Good evening. Praise God to all of you all that are here, all those that are watching. And I just want to open up with a verse of scripture before we pray. Psalm 145, verse 5 from the Passion Translation Bible. It says, Your magnificent splendor and the miracles of your majesty are my constant meditation. Jumping back to verse 4, it says, Generation after generation will declare more of your greatness and declare more of your glory. We are here tonight, Father God, to listen to Fritz and listen how you have impacted history and the difference that we can make. And God, you've spoke these verses from a long, long time ago, and they're now alive, and we're reading them as history. Going from generation to generation, you will declare more of your greatness and declare more of your glory. So, Lord God, I pray and we ask together that you would open our minds and you would open our hearts to understand 
and receive what Fritz is teaching us and giving us tonight, and that we would be more equipped to release the gospel into the world, that they would not only know the past, but we could live today in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Fritz, thank you. Okay. All right. Well, welcome here, everybody. Good to, good to see you. And if you're online, welcome to you as well. Uh, we've been talking about Benedict Arnold and John Andre for actually the past two meetings. So we're going to get a little bit of Arnold spillover, clean up a few things we didn't talk about, uh, get, do some dealing with gerrymandering, and uh, uh, look at Top Gun briefly. Okay, because it's actually tied in with the Bible, believe it or not. And then we'll look at another deserter right. or deserter. <laughs> okay. So anyway, uh, let's see what we got here. Remember, as always, this is our definition we've been looking at for history. Uh, Senator Daniel Webster, I, I think he makes this back in about 1830s, but it's, it's so real, it's so correct, you know. History is God's providence in human affairs. He's got his hand in the way things are going on, and we don't always feel that way, okay, but, ah. And there's an original intent from God for the United States, and, and our founding fathers, when they put together the Declaration and the uh, Constitution, also have an original intent for the United States. So. A little bit of an epilogue. What had happened to some of these people we were talking about? Arnold and Andre, well, for Arnold, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall, out of Proverbs. All right. And George Washington receives a letter from a Lieutenant Colonel John Lorenz. We'll talk about Lorenz a little bit more in the future. We talked about him in the past. He is actually one of Washington's right-hand men. He's an aide for a, a, a period of time. But by this particular time, I think he's moved on and he's doing something else with the military. So, but, but he writes George, and he, uh, um, in that letter, he kind of says, you know, hey, I think Arnold, you know, he's suffering all sorts of mental turmoil, turmoil, and he's going through his own mental hell from all he's done, and you know, he's got to live with the consequences of that. So, is is Arnold hardened in his sin? And if you check out Proverbs 28, 14, blessed is the man who always fears the Lord, but he who hardens his heart falls into trouble. Well, is Arnold in that hardening his, his heart thing? Washington writes back, and again, guys, there's such a preponderance of all these primary source documents that we can read what Washington actually says in a lot of his correspondence. So you don't have to believe the history books, which leave out a lot of stuff, okay? Washington writes back, but I am mistaken if at this time Arnold's undergoing torments of a mental hell. He wants feeling. Now, guys, we don't use this kind of wants too much anymore. In this case, change the wants to lacks. He lacks feeling. Okay. It was, I think, a more common usage of the word back in those times. I don't hear it used a whole lot anymore. Okay, So he lacks feeling. From some trace of his character, which had lately come to my knowledge, he seems to have been so hackneyed in villainy and so lost to all sense of honor and shame, there will be no time for remorse. So as far as Washington is concerned, he doesn't think he's going to go you know, through this mental torment. Right? Uh, pretty much every year, and I, I, don't, I don't remember if it's at the end of the year, December or, or January, but annual list of most popular names, names you don't see anymore. Any of you guys name your kid Lucifer <laughs> or Jezebel? Okay. Maybe Lucy. <laughs> yeah, Lucy's good, okay. But, but doesn't that come from Lucille, you know? Uh, uh, you know, Jezebel, not exactly an upstanding character out of the Bible. Delilah, Jonah. Uh, Jonah gets a bad rap because, you know, hey, bad luck, Jonah. Uh, although he wasn't doing, except for ignoring what God said, which I guess isn't great, 
he wasn't doing a whole lot of evil like some of these other ones, like a Jezebel. Okay. Uh, you don't see a lot of people named Judas anymore. And if you happen to be in Norway and somebody calls you a Vitkin Quisling, okay, because they've just called you a traitor, okay? This is the Norwegian Benedict Arnold. So I don't think there's a whole lot of Vidkins up there anymore. Okay, I haven't checked, but hey. Okay. America, Benedict. Okay. There's an American army doctor from the time. Could Arnold have been suspended on the gibbet? Okay, and the gibbet's where they were hanging the people from, you know? Hang by the neck until dead. Erected for Andre, not a tear or sigh would have been produced, but exaltation and joy would have been visible on every countenance. So, could we take Andre off of getting hung for being a spy against the Americans and put Arnold on there? I think most of the Americans would have applauded. Okay. Historian Nathaniel Philbrick, Arnold was now the loneliest man on God's earth. Okay. Arnold's got a friend by the name of Oswald. He has convinced the world that he is as base as a prostitute, okay? And we're not talking baseball here, okay? Base is kind of a term like, you know, hey, how low can you go? Uh, so, the British, we got Andre, I'm sorry, we got Arnold, but we lost Andre. Was it worth it? Well, I think most of them would think, no, probably not. Okay? And Andre is hung. Arnold managed to escape. Okay? And if you're a British officer, and you now got Arnold working for you, you know, working with the British Army, this guy sold out the Americans for 20,000 pounds. If he's going to sell out his country, can we trust him? So I don't think there's ever really a whole lot of people that become super close friends with him. Actually, somebody in the House of Lords, which is kind of equivalent to our U.S. Senate, uh, Arnold's a living symbol of treason. So uh, that's something he's got to live with, all okay? right? Now, Pennsylvania Packet is a newspaper in the 18th century, and they actually put together this cartoon. And they've got a caption that goes along with it, okay? Uh, at the back of the general, and this is what they actually write in the newspaper here, at the back of the general was a figure of the devil dressed in black robes, shaking a purse of money at the general's left ear, and in his right hand a pitchfork, ready to drive him into hell as the reward due for the many crimes which his thirst for gold made him commit. Okay? And you can see our Satan right here, okay? Um, I don't think that's quite a biblically correct Satan, okay? Although the fact that he's, you know, dangled money in front of somebody would be, I think, a pretty biblically correct thing. But, uh, eh, the pitchfork and stuff, the horns, eh, I don't think so, okay? Um, notice they got a two-faced, they don't have Arnold to hang in person, so they're going to hang a, a kind of a dummy. We got two-faced. And if somebody calls you two-faced, uh, that's not a compliment either, guys. Uh, it's kind of when you just say one thing and say something else to somebody else, okay? But this is an actual cartoon from our Pennsylvania packet, okay? Now, we've looked at so many documents where they're talking from Congress and from George Washington about God, okay? Well, look what the paper's doing here. And look who they're giving credit to, unlike modern-day America. Arnold's design, and this is a quote part, designed to have given up this fortress, West Point in New York, to our enemies has been discovered by the goodness of an omniscient creator, okay? Omniscient, all-knowing, okay? It's in the paper, and they're publishing it, okay, to the public, okay? I'm, Mark, all you got to do is tomorrow when you get your copy of the Washington Post and New York Times, you open it up, I'm sure you'll find that in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. They also write in there, if you read a little further, uh, discovery of is my wording, but uh, that's because I cut out, cut out some stuff. 
Um, the treachery of this ungrateful general is another instance in the interposition of bounteous providence. And remember, providence is a term they used back in that time for God. Okay? You know, we, we use God a lot more frequently. We don't use providence quite so much anymore. But that was a common term for God. Okay? The effigy of this ingrate is therefore hanged for want of his body, for lack of his body. Again, the same usage there, as a traitor to his native country and a betrayer of the laws of honor. Okay. Guys, this is Sir Henry Clinton. More spillover effects from Arnold. Okay. Historian Christian Hibbert on Andre's death, the British officer that was hung as a spy by the Americans. Clinton was almost as distressed as he had been when his wife had died. Okay. And, and Andre is his like right-hand man, his aide, his helper in in New York, you know, helping him run, do things with his military and controlling things. So, so concerned were they by his grief, they sent for his old friend William Phillips, who did his best to comfort him, but it was a long time before he overcame the bitter sorrow. You know, again, so a very tight relationship there, and he's lost somebody, you know. This is one of the two aides that Benedict Arnold has, uh, Major David Franks, well, if you're the aide of a guy that's been a traitor, what are most Americans going to think about you? Um, Washington places him under arrest. And he was very honest, you know, I, I, I don't really want to do this, but I need to do it. You don't know how far it goes down. Who, who's been compromised? Who's a traitor? Okay, so I've got to take these officers that are in key positions and keep an eye on them, okay? Well, 24th of November, 1780, Franks write, writes George, George, or G.W., George Washington, to publish the inquiry report of Arnold, okay? So, they investigate Arnold. Can you publish it is what David Franks, the aide, asks. And why? That report may be put in orders as soon as possible, because many people right now, even uh, two months later, think I'm connected with Arnold and I'm part of this conspiracy. So he's been tainted or poisoned by what's going on with Arnold, okay? And by the way, guys, he's innocent. He's eventually cleared, okay? But for at least two months, he's sitting on the hot seat, okay? And people are shunning him and calling him names, maybe, and that kind of stuff. Here's our other aid, more collateral damage. To George Washington from Lieutenant Colonel Richard Varick, I have the honor to inform Your Excellency that I think my health is so far restored as to enable me to attend a court of inquiry into my conduct. Okay, when we looked at him on September 25th, he was actually in a sick bed the day that Arnold is discovered and all this turmoil happens with uh, Arnold trying to escape and uh, Andre uh, getting captured, that kind of stuff. Okay? He was in his sick bed, and he took him a while to heal from that. As a matter of fact, I think actually he started to heal from that and then ended up with getting something else. So uh, I'm healthy. Have that court of inquiry look into my conduct. Uh, is there a wish natural to young man to preserve my reputation inviolate? I'm concerned about my reputation and what it means in this world. And guys, they had a... a a higher sense of honor, I think, than most Americans do now, okay? So, um, that I may be indulged with a fair, candid, and rigid inquiry into my conduct, okay? So, look at me, investigate me, uh, do it very strictly, because I expect to be cleared. That's what he wants, Because, right? again, he's been tainted by association with Arnold, and by the way, well, let's look what Washington says here a month after that, or, or soon after that. Washington is pleased to approve the report of a court inquiry. Lieutenant Colonel Varick's conduct in regards to treason of Gen General Arnold, it's not only unimpeachable, but it shows a degree of a merit that does him great honor and particularly distinguishes him as a sincere friend to his country, okay? So that court of inquiry clears him, okay? But it takes two months to do that. And by the way, he goes along and does great things. Washington is impressed by this young man, okay? 
And he's got all these you know, documents and stuff, you know, letters and stuff he's been sent, sent back and forth. I need to have these organized. We need to save these. Hey, Colonel Varick, I want you to take a hold of these and organize them for me. 44 volumes he puts together. Okay? And all those different things. He's got a different category for each of those. So he does apparently a quite a good job, and it's one of the reasons why we got, again, those documents in modern-day times, which allows us to look at the truth, uh, which, again, we don't always get in modern-day history books. Guys, he serves 11 times as mayor of New York City. They had one-year terms. So if you don't like the bum, they're gone. Okay? You can vote them out real quick. And he is actually one of the original founders of the American Bible Society in 1816, okay? A couple of years later, he becomes a president. I think he's actually the president of it at the death, okay? So, um, and by the way, I think this, if I remember correctly, this is our first Bible Society in America, okay? Um, you know, they got, obviously, the Bible being used in churches and things along that line, but you get an actual Bible society. And there's going to be a Maryland Bible society and, and a number of other ones that happen, too. Okay? So, but he's tainted for a while. Our, uh, our young man, Joseph Plum Martin, we met, met him sometime last year. He was only 15 years old when he joined up. We, I think, first met him at the Battle of Brooklyn, but he writes, again, this incredible biography autobiography, what happens to himself, and uh, again, seems to be very inaccurate. Well, guys, he's now an old man. He's been in service 15, 16, 17, 18, and he's now 19, okay? Old man, seen a lot of stuff, and not, not a whole lot of it not very good, four years in uniform, on John Andre, okay? This British guy that was captured and hung as a spy. Um, again, a lot of sympathy among the Americans for him, but here's what Plum Martin say, Joseph Plum Martin. There's been a great deal said about him, but he was but a man, and no better than the brave Captain Hale, who was our spy spying on the British, whom the British commander caused to be executed as a spy in 1776 without the shadow of a trial. We gave him, a, we gave Andre a trial under George Washington, denied him the use of a Bible or the assistance of a clergyman in his last moments, and destroyed the letters he had written to his widowed mother or other relations, okay? Now, Andre was afforded pretty much everything that was decent, okay? This is the only historical source I found for this, okay? I haven't found anything contradicting it, but I haven't found anything else supporting it. Uh, but again, Plum Martin's account, generally very good, um, but I haven't been able to back that up with anything else. Martin's lack of sympathy, Nathan Hale, hung by the British, he's from Connecticut, Martin's from Connecticut. He, they're both soldiers in the Army, okay? Um, they actually live relatively close to each other, but not the kind of thing where you'd see them every day or every month or maybe even every year. Uh, back in those days, a little bit further away. But uh, I think he's got a lot of sympathy for Nathan Hale and uh, too much concern here over Andre. He's pretty biblically literate. Okay? His grandparents broke him, uh, brought him up uh, part of the time with, uh, and made sure that he got some Bible knowledge because you see it in his writing sometimes. And he writes on uh, Joseph Plum Martin on Benedict Arnold. Before heading south to Dobbs Ferry, which is on the Hudson River in New York, Joseph awakens at night to go pilfer some watermelons he had been dreaming about. Okay, well, one of the things in the Army, you never quite get enough to eat, okay? I think all the food when I was in was going to the Marine Corps back there, you know? They got all the food, okay? <laughs> us, us poor Army guys, you know, we were left out, you know? So, actually, probably it was the other way around, you know? Army had uh, more clout. So, because, heck, you had the Navy to stick up for you, and that doesn't say a whole lot, you know? <laughs> Sorry if I got any Navy men in here, you know? All right. Um, well, he's biblically literate, but what is it? The seventh commandment, thou shalt not steal? I don't, seventh or eighth? I forgot which one, okay? I don't think he paid much attention to that one, or he's, at least he's forgotten it. The watermelons are too much of a temptation. So he goes and into this field and gets some and hides them in a wagon before they leave. Right. 
But while he's at Dobbs Ferry, that's where he learns that Benedict Arnold, our top combat general for the Americans, uh, and a big hero at that time, had deserted. Okay? He writes, had I possessed the power of foreknowledge, I might twice have put Arnold to sleep without anyone knowing it and saved the life of perhaps a better man. You do see a little sympathy for Andre here, okay? He considered Andre better than Arnold, okay? I could have saved his life and my country much trouble and disgrace. Now, put Arnold to sleep, what does that mean? Guys, look at all these Bible verses here. Matthew, Mark, John, Acts, Corinthians, Thessalonians, okay? Falling asleep in all of them, it means passing away, okay? In that sense. So, I could have helped Arnold along to pass away to his maker, okay? Which probably isn't going to be a great reunion, okay? Um, anyway, that's what he writes. His second opportunity he writes about, he was down near Dobbs Ferry, and he observed General Arnold there. Apparently, Arnold was by himself. And uh, Martin writes, he looked guilty, and well he might, for Satan was in full possession for him at that instance, as ever he was of Judas. It only wanted, guys, here, actually our third use of wanted, it only lacked a musket ball to have driven Satan out. Okay, So if I'd shot, shot Arnold right there, a lot of the trouble would have gone away. And Satan would have left Arnold, okay? Uh, we've seen both of these artistic re renditions. On the left, you've got Nathan Hale, the American spy that was captured in 1776. Um, and on the right, John Andre. Both of them actually confessed. Andre was afraid of being put on the gibbet, you know, this thing here. Because uh, back in those days, a lot of times they left you up there for a long time. Well, they, they leave him on there 30 minutes to make sure he's dead. Then they take him down. Right? And they bury him right at the foot of the uh, hangman's thing. And actually, a nice little lady comes along. And she plants a peach tree there because the Americans didn't put any marker on it that I'm aware of. But you could always tell where Andre was buried because of the peach tree that the lady planted. Our Benedict Arnold, I'm sorry, our, our Nathan Hale, the American captured by the British, left up hanging for three days, okay? which isn't a particularly good thing okay? for a lot of reasons. On Mark's grave, and the best they can figure is somewhere along Third Avenue in, in uh, uh, Manhattan in New York, somewhere between 66 and 46th Street, so 10 block area, okay? If you ever get in that area, you know, say a prayer for, thank you, Nathan Hale, for what you did. Remember that famous American remark, uh, or I regret that I have only but one life to live for my country, or give for my country. Okay. So, our John Jacob, Rifle Jack Peterson, and Moses Sherwood, what happens to those guys? Guys, these guys are sitting on there making the apple cider on, uh, on the banks of the Hudson, and they see the British ship, the Vulture, with a, a small bo boat, <laughs> with them, British soldiers on it. I think it has like, like about a dozen, and they're headed for right where they are to land on the shore, okay? And they get the rifles and start taking pot shots at them, okay? These black patriots start shooting that back at them, you know, uh, or shooting at them, and it really causes a series of events what leads to Andre being captured as a spy and to discover Arnold's uh, being a traitor. Peterson, after this event, okay, well, Black Jack Peterson, he was taken pr prisoner by the British and put on a British prison ship. These British pr prison ships, they anchor them in New York Harbor. Uh, they're generally ships that are no longer seaworthy. Um, I don't think they let you up to see the sunshine. You're not fed very well. You're not given medical treatment. And about, let's say, I think 11,000 or 1,000 of them died, 11,000 Americans died on those ships, okay? Um, so it's probably somewhere like half. Somehow, Peterson is able to get out, shinnies down the anchor chain, or rope, I don't know which it was, probably a chain, okay, and escapes, okay. So, uh, again, two black patriots. He's uh, blackjack, pretty well respected, 
but uh, never, should we say, makes a whole lot of money. And General Philip Van Cortland gives him a house for his services, and he gets a U.S. Army veteran's pension. Right. In uh, 1967, the Daughters of the American Revolution put up a monument. It's right there on the point, uh, uh, Teller's Point. Commemorating the defense of Teller's Point by George Sherwood and Jack Peterson, who repulsed the landing of British troops from the Vulture, September 21st, 1780, aiding in the capture of Major Andre. Okay. They are buried in New York. I don't think they ever traveled very far, but uh, uh, 107 years old and 106 years old. One of those figures is really, uh, seems to be nailed down historically very well. The other one uh, might be somewhat nebulous, but they, they generally live a long life, and their graves are still out there. Uh, you can go visit them. Okay. And um, two months ago, we actually looked at this Army unit, and they were called... Uh, they had taken their, uh, kind of a nickname for their unit, and they, I think they called them themselves the Black Jack Unit or something like that, okay? Um, but they had used these two American patriots kind of as a name for their National Guard unit out in New York. Well, we had seen they had gone actually to a museum in Peekskill, New York, and there was a cannon there that had those uh, Black Jacks and, and Moses' his name on it that was kind of dedicated to them and their heroism and, uh, you know, helping to stop the traitor Arnold, although at that time they didn't know. So they actually go visit that family, and you can tell this is COVID because they still got all their masks on. This is 2021. Uh, but Rifle Jack had 11 kids, okay? So there's probably a whole lot of descendants out there, and, uh, you know, we got some of them, you know, right here that they visited, so. Andre's captors, Washington writes Samuel Huntington, 7th October, I have now the pleasure to communicate the names of three persons who captured Major Andre and who refused to release him, notwithstanding assurances of a liberal reward. Their conduct merits our warmest esteem. They have prevented, in all probability, our suffering, one of the severest strokes it could have been mediated against us, okay? and that would have been taking of West Point. Okay? Their names are John Paulding, David Williams, and Isaac Van Wart. And guys, they're held up. Guys, if you want to be a great American patriot, look at what these guys did. And we got Asher Duran's painting right there, uh, and there's been a number of paintings of that. Okay? Um, they are recognized at, back at that time. They got a $200 pension per year. They're the peasant patriots, again, held up very high. They're awarded farm, farms, I believe, by the state of New York. Gave them farms. 1803, there's a play, The Glory of Columbia. A lot of their story is in there. And they actually bring, bring back that play nine years later. 1812, we're in war again. Anybody know who against who? Or remember? We're against, fighting against Britain. So, guys... They bring back this patriotic story and resurrect this play to show Americans, you know, hey, look how patriotic we were back in the American Revolution. You know, we need to do the same kind of thing. Okay? And actually, they do that in World War II or in 1940 uh, with the story of Sergeant Alvin York, a hero of American Revolution. Okay? Hollywood makes a movie. Okay? So... Um, there is a monument to what they did in Terrytown, New York, which is where Andre is captured. Three honest militiamen, militiamen arrested Major General Andre, Adjutant General of the British Army, disguised, preventing disaster to the American cause. Okay. A rarity for enlisted men? Congress had sometimes issued medals, but they were generally for colonels or generals or something like that. These guys get a silver medal awarded to them, and I'm not a Latin scholar. It says, uh, apparently, fidelity on the front, in the left side, and on the right side, amor, patria, Vincent. Um, Latin apparently translates the love of country conquers, okay? Amor, you know, the French, French is a Latin language, or Latin derivative, so that's a word they use, patria, patriotic, Vincent, victory. So, John Paulding, he actually gets a ballad written about him, right? with 13 stanzas, right? 
right? And it's actually pretty catchy. I'm not going to bore you with all 13 stanzas, but here's some of them. And uh, the guy rhymes them up pretty good and stuff like that. Come all you brave Americans and unto me give ear, and I'll sing you a ditty that will your spirits cheer. Concerning a young gentleman whose age was 22, he fought for North America. His heart was just and true. Okay? Then he stepped, then up stepped this young hero, John Paulding was his name. Sir, tell us where you're going and also whence you came. I bear the British flag, sir. I have a pass to go this way. I'm on an expedition. I have no time to stay. And this is what Arnold is saying. I'm sorry, Andre, not Arnold. Okay. Andre saw that his conspiracy would soon be brought to light. He begged for pen and paper. He asked leave to write a line to General Arnold to let him know his fate and beg for his assistance. But now it was too late. And this is, I think, the last stanza here because he's being about ready to be hung for being a spy. It moved each eye with pity, caused every heart to bleed, and everyone wished him released and Arnold in his stead. You know, let's trade Arnold for Andre. He was a man of honor in Britain. He was born to die upon the gallows. Most highly he did scorn. And uh, I think we saw that last month, his reaction when he saw the gallows. You know, he kind of backed up. And he had performed, uh, British Major Andre had performed pretty heroically in, uh, in front of everybody. But a little bit of a stumble there. Um, later, American spy master Benjamin Talmadge, he's again one of Washington's right-hand men, and he is the operational commander of what's called the Culpa Ring, C-U-L-P-A, okay, which is Washington's spies that are spying on the British. And he had spent about a week with Andre, getting to know him, and Andre is this wonderful person, you know, he's, a, he's an artist and he's a, uh, a poet. And he's got this wonderful personality that kind of like attracts people to him. And he gets this little cult of Americans around him that get to know him. And, oh, Andre's such a wonderful guy. You know, do we really need to kill him? You know, yes, he was a spy and they hung, hung our spy, but do we need to do that to him? Uh, so I think he comes under the cult worship of Andre. Historian John Knight, what's remarkable is that within this, their lifetime, our three heroes up there had gone from vaunted heroes of the revolution to disreputable opportunists on no other evidence than the testimony of an enemy spy. And one of the things that um, Talmadge had found out spending that time with, with Andre, you know, he was telling him, oh, well, they took my coat and they kind of tore through the coat looking in the linings and looking for stuff. Well, if, if you think you've captured a spy, that would be something you would do, okay? Tear those clothes open. And remember, State of New York actually had a law. If you capture a British soldier or a British, uh, a British sympathetic American, they call, you know, again, loyalists or Tories, they were called. If you capture one of those, you know, you can go through their stuff. You can take their money, you know, their valuables, their watches and, and stuff like that. So, again, that was a New York State law. So they were doing within the law, maybe not the most ethical thing to do in the eyes of our Lord, but uh, it was legal in the state of New York. Um, so that would have been something that they should have done. But uh, Talmadge really likes Andre and thinks these guys are uh, opportunists, I guess. All right, a command and a promise. Okay. Genesis 9-7, and you, be fruitful and multiply, Increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. Now, it said, it's written one or two times in the Bible, or maybe that many times. Okay? Almost every one of those verses actually has that phrase in it, be fruitful and multiply. Not all of them do, but the idea comes across. Okay? Um, a lot of it in Genesis, Leviticus, Exodus, Psalms, okay? A command with a promise. Be fruitful and multiply. There's actually some other verses too. Here's some more. Uh, well, Paulding believes in this. You know, one of these three guys that captures Andre, he has 21 kids. <laughs> outlives two wives. Okay? I think that the third wife actually outlives him. 
Uh, but I think he must have read his Bible, at least that section, you know, coming from, you know, Genesis about being fruitful and multiply. Because he does multiply. Okay? Now, taking that to modern day times, okay, I don't know if you guys heard anything about H.R. 26. It was in, let's see, we're in February, popped up in Congress in the House of Representatives last month. Okay? And think about this idea, be, be fruitful and multiply. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Okay? And for, uh, for justice, let's see, Katani Jackson, male and female, okay? since she can't seem to figure out what a woman is. Okay? If you ignore a God promise or command with a promise, what happens? Okay. Be fruitful and multiply. And, and think about that in regards to America. Well, H.R. 26 is called the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act. And one of the reasons this is out there, well, for one thing, conservatives, Republicans get a, a control of the House of Representatives, Okay. which allows them to put that through the House. Okay. And I think it was three years, might be four years now, Governor N Ralph Northam from Virginia stood up, and Virginia was talking about putting through some kind of bill that if you had a baby that survived abortion— it was an amazing thing in an awful way to sit there and look at because he made a speech in front of everybody, and luckily it was taped, and it was all over the news, at least the conservative sites. It was probably covered up by uh, NBC and CNN and stuff like that. But it was something to the effect, well, you know, if you have this baby and survive, you know, you take the baby and, you know, you put them down, and then you have the doctors and the parents discuss, and then they can decide what to do, okay? Should we... Let the baby live. Should we kill the baby? You know, and, and he didn't actually say kill the baby or anything along that line. But the implication was there. Let the baby die. Okay. So the Republicans, after two years of a uh, Democratic House, a Democratic Senate, and a Democratic president, born alive abortion survivors protection act. Okay. What does the bill establish? If you look at the summary. Requirements for the degree of care in the case of a child born alive following an abortion or attempted. So it's, that's what it's looking for. All right. Be fruitful and multiply. A healthcare practitioner must exercise the same degree of care as would reasonably be provided to any other child born alive, like un, under normal circumstances, a wanted child. Okay. Ensure the child is immediately administered to a hospital. Additionally, a healthcare practitioner who has the knowledge uh, of a failure to comply, you need to report that failure of your hospital or, or whatever, abortion clinic, to law enforcement if they're not following through. Failure to comply, a fine up to five years in prison, or maybe even both. Yay. Okay? Well, yay and boo, okay? Uh, and an individual who intentionally kills or attempts to kill a child born alive is subject to prosecution for murder, okay? Guys, most laws, or most states in the United States, you have a pregnant woman and you shoot them or knife them and the mom dies and the baby dies, yep. you're convicted for two murders or, or they, they put you up for two murders, okay? Okay? I think some of the states are actually already changing that, okay? And uh, Mark, while I said boo, House of Representatives, will this bill ever be passed into law? Not unless we do a whole lot more praying, probably, you know. Um, the Senate, right at the moment, is still controlled by, you know, liberals, Democrats, pro-abortionists, although I, actually I guess they got one in the hospital right now. And, and maybe that means there's nobody there to vote, okay? Uh, up in Pennsylvania, I don't know if you heard the senator there, who a lot of people had concern about his health when they were voting for him, but they voted him in anyway, and now he's, uh, he's under mental depression, okay? Um, 
And the president is very, very pro-abortion, probably more so than even President Obama, okay? So the president's got to sign that if it was a law. He's also got to pass the Senate. So the odds of this bill ever becoming a law are, under normal circumstances, not real good, okay? Uh, you know, appeal to heaven. That's what we got to do, I think, okay? Uh, by the way, prosecution of the mother is barred. Results of the House bill vote, votes by party. Hey, I like those votes, okay? Actually, what amazes me is this Democrat right here, okay? You got one guy who looks at it and says, we got a failed abortion. There's a baby lying there that's alive. Do we go ahead and let it die? And that Democrat says no. Was it that huh? Was it Manchin? I'll show you here on the next slide who it is. No, we're, we're talking House, not Senate, okay? Oh, okay. Okay? So, boy, you talk about a, a partisan vote here, guys. 219 Republicans, 210 Democrats against, okay? It, it does pass the House, but again, it doesn't become a law until it passes the Senate and the, the House of, or uh, the President's signature, okay? So it does pass uh, January 11th. What does it say when one Democrat votes for a bill to stop murder of a baby born alive? There's your answer. Republican Henry Cuellar out of Texas, he voted for it. Maybe the only Democrat that can think for themselves. Okay. Vincent Gonzalez, he voted president in a way that's kind of like... Uh, Eh, I don't want to get involved on this. I don't want to be for it. I don't want to be against it. You know, it might hurt my, my chance for voting, okay? So just let, let me, hey, I was here, okay? Uh, no guts one way or the other. Check all these wonderful Maryland congressmen, okay? Eastern Shore is the only place where we got a Republican, okay? And by the way, guys, I'm independent. I'm not Republican. I'm not Democrat. Okay. I, I am conservative, though. Um, we've had, actually had two congressmen in this area up until a little less than a year ago. Okay, so if you were, wanted to write your congressman, there was one of two people, depending on where you lived. Okay. One of them was Jamie Raskin. And I think, actually, he, when, he, when his family came over from Europe, I think the original name was Jamie Rascal. And they, they thought that maybe wasn't a very good name, so they changed it to Raskin. Okay, now I'm being facetious, guys. I, I don't know if that's true or not, but um, uh, um, you guys remember my friend Guy Whitten that was here for World War II. And actually, if you're in my American Studies II class, you maybe got a chance to see paratrooper uh, uh, Guy Whitten, okay? Came in and told us about World War II and the Great Depression. Okay. Um, Raskin was his congressman, and they didn't care for him okay, at all. Uh, David Trone, okay? Well, we're not going to leave that quite yet, but we're going to take a side tour here and look at a guy by the name of Eldridge Gary, okay, this guy right here. He signs the Declaration of Independence, okay? So he's a founding follower, follower or founder of the United States, and uh, hey, pretty brave thing to do at that particular time because if the British got a hold of the names that were on there, they could execute those guys for treason. He works at the Constitutional Convention, speaks over a hundred times in the debates on it. I think probably the only two people that speak more are James Madison and Governor Morris. Okay? It's not Governor Morris, it's Governor, and that's his actual name. Okay? Those two guys, I think, were the two leading speakers during the debates. So he's pretty much involved. He becomes a member of Congress, governor of Massachusetts, and vice president of the United States. Okay? I'm not going to sign the Constitution. How come it doesn't have a Bill of Rights? And if you don't remember, guys, they don't pass the Bill of Rights until two years after the Constitution. Okay? It's uh, 1789, if I remember correctly. Okay? He's not the only one. Right across the Potomac River, which would be that way, okay? 
There's a guy by the name of George Mason. There's a university down there in Northern Virginia named after him. Okay? He doesn't sign it either. No Bill of Rights. Okay? And it gets to be a pretty strong debate. Okay? Well, gerrymander. It's actually a term in American politics that's stuck. March 26, 1812, the Boston Gazette, the newspaper, reports on the gerrymander, a new species of monster. Okay? Governor, or Eldridge Gary is our governor at that time, and he has a redistricting plan. And he redistricts so it takes the Federalist votes, and, and he's a, a Republican. And by the way, guys, Republicans here at this 1812 are not the same as modern-day Republicans um, the modern-day Republicans actually get their evolution from Abraham Lincoln and the other Republicans in the 1850s. Okay, so there's a Republican Party, and then it kind of disappears, and then it kind of re reappears in the 1850s with different kind of structure. Okay. Well, what he does is he takes the Federalist votes, and he finds the areas where the Federalists are, and puts them all in one area, okay? Now, good thing about that, you're pretty much guaranteed a seat in Congress for whatever that district is. Bad thing about it, if you've got districts that are very, very close, where maybe there's like a 52% to 48% in the different parties, okay, you lose the opportunity to win closely contested districts, okay? So you're guaranteed some seats, but you lose the opportunity to maybe gain a whole lot more because everybody's packed in the same area. What's the result? His Republican Party gets 29 seats. The Federalists get 11. Okay? And that's in the state legislatures. Okay? That's, it doesn't have to do with Congress at that particular time. Okay? But it's the same idea. Newspaper writes, the horrid mon monster of which this drawing is a correct representation appeared in the county of Essex during the last session of the legislature, okay? So guys, this is the actual legislature that they draw up to make the boundaries for the voters, okay? And again, it concentrates uh, Federalists here and Republicans there or whatever, okay? Uh, I don't think the district actually had these wings on or this nice tongue you know, with these big teeth or these claws, okay? But apparently, they actually got the names of the, of the like, counties here, like, like, like Lynn County and uh, Andover County, it looks like, okay? So this is the actual district they make, okay? So that term, um, and, and they, gerrymander comes from, like, a, a long, skinny salamander, uh, apparently, that's where the term, they take J Jerry's name and they call this the gerrymander instead of the salamander, okay? But it's long and skinny and they manipulate it any way they want, okay? Um, well, Maryland 6th District, this is the way it used to be, okay? Uh, Garrett County, Allegheny County, Washington County, Frederick County, Carroll County, and I tell you the truth, I don't even know what the counties we got up here north of Baltimore are here, okay? I'm sorry? Hartford? Okay. So it uh, looks like part of Hartford County, okay? There's Westminster up there, center of kind of Carroll County. All those things were in the 6th District um, up until 2011, okay? Now, every 10 years, according to the Constitution, they take a census. And one of the reasons why they have a census, we can figure out how many people are in certain places so we can determine how many or how many representatives each state gets. Now, uh, next census looks like New York, Illinois, and California. They're going to drop. Okay? And it looks like Florida and Texas are going to increase okay? because people are deserting these areas. Apparently, quite a few of them. Okay? So, when we take the 2020 or 2030 census, okay, and then they'll redistrict in 2031, okay, you will have more uh, things, I guess, going to those states. Okay? New York, California, Illinois will lose reps. Texas and Florida will go up. 
Okay, so that was our districts, and there was a uh, House of Representatives representative there, uh, my name, Roscoe Bartlett, he held that seat for 20 years. Okay. 2011, hey, we got a new census. We got Democrats in control of the Maryland State Legislature. Let's redistrict this place. Okay. They take the uh, sixth district. They still got Garrett, Allegheny, Washington, part of Frederick County, including the city. Okay. Because one of the principles in districting, you try to keep a community of the same interests. Well, we're talking rural agricultural right there. This is all rural agricultural, northern part of Frederick County. Uh, I think most of uh, Carroll County up in the northern part, western part, is the same. Okay. But they take it on down, and they throw in Frederick City and this part of Frederick County, and then into Montgomery County, which has begun, uh, I'm sad to say, there's not the uh, agricultural things going on here like there was when I was a kid. Okay? I used to ride out to Gaithersburg to the fair, <laughs> and there was a one-lane road going each way, and it was country, farm country. Okay? Not like that anymore. Okay? Um, so this becomes our new district for the 6th district. Which means the rest of Frederick County, okay, because people who go to this church are generally Frederick or Upper Montgomery County, okay, Damascus area. Here's our other district. Remember our principles for districting? Make it fairly compact, compact and have a community of interests. You know, city people, farmers, miners, you know, whatever. However you determine that. So, we've got a district, which includes Upper Frederick County, part of Carroll County, goes in here and would include uh, most of the area here for uh, Bethesda United Methodist Church, you know, Damascus, okay, down into Laytonsville, but then we got a little teeny trickle here, down here, and we include Kensington, where I used to live a long time ago, okay, and Chevy Chase, okay, uh, Rockville, Guys, those are city areas. And is it gerrymandering, Barbara? Oh, yes. Okay. No doubt. Well, Judicial Watch is actually a very good organization. They, they keep an eye on things that are going on in the government, okay? Uh, you know, legislatures and president and all that other stuff, okay? And they, they file a lawsuit, and it uh, was set for a trial on March 15th, 18th, 2022. And their lawsuit details. Maryland's recent history of partisan gerrymandering is no secret. Actually, I think this one goes to the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, one of the most notorious partisan gerrymanders in United States history. Okay. Uh, done by Democrats. And actually, I think about the same time, though, there's some gerrymandering going down in North Carolina that I believe was done by Republicans. Okay? So it's not necessarily a one-party thing, just one side. Okay? Um, a federal district judge <laughs> openly doubted that it could provide fair and effective representation for all citizens. Another called it absurd to suggest that there is a community of interest in a district described as a Rorschach-like eyesore <laughs> or as a broken wing pterodactyl. Okay? So the judges aren't particularly happy with this. It will go to court. Um, if you don't know what Rorschach is, yeah. that's it. Guys, it's a psychological test. They take and they make ink blots. I need to analyze you to see if you guys are sane. Now, what do you see in here, okay? Ink I see a mess. <laughs> Looks like my grand, four-year-old granddaughter's finger paint, okay? Okay? That's what the Senate, or I'm sorry, the, the judge is comparing it to. It's like a Rorschach ink blot. Or... This pterodactyl doesn't have a broken wing, but pretty well spread out, going everywhere, okay? Lots of gaps in it, okay? That's what the judge says. Hey, this is what the Maryland district looks like. It's gerrymandering, okay? The result of that case, it's gone. And you may remember, I don't know if you intended on voting the primary early uh, or in the primary. Um, the primary got backed up. 
reason is because of this case. Okay? So if you, you know, I think it was set for one date and then they had to back it up. Well, they needed to redo the districts. Okay? So that's why it was backed up. Okay? Because this gerrymandering was come up with another plan. You want to see what it looks like? Yeah. Okay. Good for thinking ahead. <laughs> I think it's the next slide. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I can always count on Pam on keeping me on a straight and narrow, you know, keep me on my toes, you know. Okay. All right. Guys, here's your new district. Um, Better, we still lose Carroll County. We get all of Frederick County in the one area, and they take Upper Montgomery County, which uh, some of it's still agricultural, but I think uh, uh, my main man back there tell you oh, we don't do quite as much farming back here as we used to in Upper Montgomery County. Okay? Um, the county, as a matter of fact, Upper Montgomery County maybe should secede from Lower Montgomery County because maybe we can get enough money together and put a wall between northern Montgomery County and southern Montgomery County. Okay. Well, they work better if you put machine guns and mines and snipers up. Okay. We haven't done very good on that. Well, it's probably not the best Christian thing to do either. But uh, yeah. anyway, all right. So as far as compactness, it's a little bit better. Uh, interests, a little bit better. And if you remember the election, it was actually pretty close. Okay, because this will be David Trone's district. Okay, so it was pretty close, which is something we can ask for. Now, guys, he's actually got a, uh, I don't know if it's every, every particular representative, but you can go to this website up here, okay? You want to contact him? You go on there, you link on there, it asks for what your zip code is because they won't respond to people out of their zip code. And, you know, then, it, you know, give me your name, your email address. Uh, do you want a response to this? Okay. Um, so you, you can see either say yes or no, I want a response, or no, I don't want a response. And then they give you a block to put your thing in there. It's actually pretty good size, so I think you can write quite a bit. Um, guys, I decided to write this guy. Took me about 10 minutes. Okay. Can you spare 10 minutes to let them know what you think? Well, um, he's got an office at Rayburn in D.C., an office in Hagerstown. And actually, I think this may have changed because on his letterhead, on his response he sent back to me, he now has an office in Gaithersburg. Okay? But again, I think that's because redistricting. And I think this information that I found online was probably before the change in districts. Okay? All right, this is what I wrote, okay? At least part of what I wrote, okay? This is my issue. I was concerned about this born alive bill. I'm an independent voter who will now do everything I can to convince people not to vote Democrat or for you. <laughs> and by the way, guys, when I was writing this, I had to loosen up the collar because the heat was coming out, okay? <laughs> okay? Last week's vote on the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection indicated that, with the exception of Democrat Henry Cuellar, there are no Democrats that can think for themselves. Okay? You are all in lockstep with whatever your leaders tell you to do. That, that act protects a person that survives an abortion and is alive. To not protect them is akin to being an accessory to the crime of murder. Okay? Um, and then I continue on. I am not a fa fan of Congressman Jerry Nadler out of N New York. Um, sorry, Lord, I th think he was a waste, but hey, you can judge me on that later. <laughs> the obviously laughable verbal attempts of Congressman Jerry Nadler to defend 200 nay votes in this case only reinforce his continued incompetence, okay? And it's not the only issue he's been kind of flaky on. We agree with you. Would Nadler kill a baby born normally? These are my questions that I wanted an answer to. Okay. 
and I'm not sure they could add, they can't read it into Nadler's mind. Would Nadler kill a baby born normally that was not aborted? Okay, that was kind of a rhetorical question, not one I expected an answer on. But I wanted an answer. Would you, David Trone? Okay. How is this not murder? Answer me that. Thank you. <laughs> nice paper. They actually said it fairly quickly. Uh, thank you for contacting me regarding women's health, reproductive rights, and access to abortion. I appreciate you sharing your concerns with me. Okay. Um, and I think David Trone must have Here's a form letter on abortion. Here's a form letter on the budget. Here's a form letter on right to bear arms, okay? All right, bring this one up, print it out, put, put the guy's name in it, you know, okay? I firmly believe that every woman has a right. Uh, oh, right, let me back up a little bit, okay? Uh, news coming out of the Supreme Court is disappointing, frustrating, and scary. Overturning Roe versus Wade has set this country on a regressive past and has endangered women across the country. We must continue fighting for women's freedom and their health care decisions. I didn't really ask about that, okay? Although, I have a concern for that. I firmly believe that every woman has a right to health care f that fits her unique needs, including reproductive care, okay? And, you know, okay? Uh, that is why I recently voted in the House for H.R. 3755, the Women's Health Protection Act, and H.R. 8927, the Enduring Access to Abortion Act. Both bills will protect a woman's right to make decisions about her own body and health care treatment options. Currently, both these bills are awaiting action, okay? You know, it's got some more stuff. Would you kill a baby? No answer. Okay. Yeah, I, I passed, what was that bill, HR, what, whatever, you know, women's access to abortion? Yeah, yeah you've answered it. Well, one thing I'm sitting here thinking about is with the recent Supreme Court Roe versus Wade um, decision, the Supreme Court Roe versus Wade, um, uh, decision, does that affect any of this that we're talking about or not really? What it actually does, okay, it kicks it back to the states. It's, it's saying, this is not an area, according to the Constitution, okay, and they are correct in that, despite what Chuck Schumer out of New York says, okay? I mean, that guy doesn't know his head from a hole in the ground, okay? It, it goes back to the states, and then states make the laws for their own decisions, okay? Which is constitutionally correct. Is it... Correct in the eyes of God, be fruitful and multiply. What are the consequences if you don't? Yeah, I understood that it put it back to the states, but, and we don't have to get into this because we don't have time, but I've been thinking now for about the past 15 minutes, how does a lot of this, because we're talking about the United States um, Senate and House, so these things that we're talking about are on the federal level. So yes. You want a microphone? No, it's okay. Um, so basically, the Roe versus, Roe versus Wade was case law, which was made based on a Supreme Court case that went up, and there was a decision made, and then a bunch of other things proceeded from that because that was what's considered precedent. There was no legislative law. There was no statutory law that was put into place. federal court that made a decision that then caused a bunch of basically waterfall effects. With that precedent being removed and there not being a federal legislation that has actually codified abortion at the federal level, it kicked it back down to the states. Now, if the Congress actually makes a law at the federal level, then 
it would have to go through the whole um, the whole court uh, system again. But theoretically, they could make a federal law codifying abortion nationwide. But right now, it's at the state level. Does that make sense? Yes. Right. So, actually, that bill infringes on on state laws as well. Okay, it, it would be my understanding of that. Okay, that would infringe on state law and responsibility according to the Constitution. Okay, but the the law okay. Biden's already trying to get a law for the whole United States that would overturn what Andy's talking about with that case. Uh, was it, the, was it the Dobbs case? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because of the Dobbs case, there's an effort in the federal government to try to make a law for the whole United States to have abortion. Okay. Even if you're a state that is against it. And, and by the way, guys, there is such a thing as judicial tyranny. Okay. We might need another revolution. Okay. Um, 2015, Obergefell decision, gay marriage. Okay. You got five justices to make a decision for the whole country about whether gay marriage should be legal or not, okay? I don't think they bothered to consult the man upstairs, okay? Now, at that time, there were 31 out of 50 states that either had constitutional amendments or laws defining what a marriage was that didn't include man and man, woman and woman, man and dog, you know, woman and monkey, you know, whatever, okay? And I'm obviously being facetious on that too, okay? But 31 states had made laws, which was their responsibility under the Constitution, okay? So let, let's move along so we don't get too bogged down. Love to talk to you more about it, Pam, sometime, okay? All right, Jamie Raskin, you can contact him. He's got a website there. Although I do not believe for anybody in Northern Montgomery County or in Frederick County, He's not your congressman anymore. He was a year ago. Not anymore. Okay. Guys, take 10 minutes. Write prone. It's not that hard to do. Okay. Even I can do it. And I'm sad to say I'm 70 years old. That's the first time I ever sent an email to my congressman. Okay. Don't wait so long. Okay. 10 minutes. I could do one last week. I can do another one this week. Picking an, or an issue, abortion, debt, crime, gun laws, you know? And if you get to your friends and say, hey, can you send a letter to this guy and have them send, you know, a letter or email to them? Um, I won't say it's going to change the whole world, but it couldn't hurt because, again, he was in a tight race, and it may make an impact, okay? And, and back it up with prayer, okay? As far as debt goes, guys, Proverbs 22, 7, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. Okay. Again, get your two friends. Um, guys, I went to the uh, uh, U.S. Treasury site on debt. As of 9-30-2022, we had 30 trillion, 928 billion, 911,613 I'm sorry, that must be millions, and then $613,306.70 okay, in debt. And that was last summer. Guys, don't get conned by the con men in the White House. Okay? Because he's, he, well, I'll, I'll t show you what he says here in a minute. There's a difference between this and debt, between deficit and debt. Okay, and the deficit is important, but it's not as important as the debt. Okay, what the deficit is? Year one, you take in four hundred dollars, okay, or four hundred billion or whatever you know, whatever the government takes in. We spend five hundred, okay. We have a deficit of a hundred dollars. Okay, it's simple math here, okay. But you can expand it up with, make it trillions or billions or whatever you want, okay, millions. 
okay? And then you go to year two, year three, year four, okay? So for our four years here, our debt uh, was negative $400, okay? Uh, normally, they put those figures in red, okay? So we took in $400 less than we spent, okay? So we have a deficit every year, but our debt continues to grow to the tune of, again, last summer, $30 trillion plus dollars, okay? And just for your FYI, guys, in 2003, 20 years ago, our debt was $6.783 trillion, okay? And you get a president, guys, semantics, words, okay? They like to use words that sound good. Oh, federal deficit. We've been doing all this by lowering the federal deficit in the two years we've been in office, $1.7 trillion. Well, actually, uh, they've looked at this, and because some laws were changed after he got these figures, it's going to be higher than that, okay? And so what he's saying is not, isn't really true, but what he really means here, which he's not telling you, okay, we may have lowered the deficit, the amount by which we're going into debt, but what it really means, I'm slowing the rate at which the country goes bankrupt, okay? So we're not going bankrupt quite as fast as we would have. <laughs> uh, guys, deficit versus debt. If he talks deficit, okay, that's just what happens in any one year. And as long as you've got a deficit, you may lower the deficit, but you're still spending more money than you got. Okay, try running your household that way. Okay, it doesn't work very well. All right. Bible and Top Gun, Isaiah 58, a conditional promise from God. Teresa, I expect you to pay attention here because part of this quote comes from you, okay? We've been talking about this. You told me about it twice. Guys, 1986 mega hit. I think I've seen it at least twice, if not three times. If you have not seen it, it's quite good. Uh, and I gather, heck, we just had a, a remake or a... Uh, Updated version in 2022, which I was told was pretty good. I haven't seen it yet, okay? Um, what actually happens is the United States Navy, and I think probably they were looking to Vietnam, and they looked at dogfights between American pilots and North Vietnamese pilots, which probably also included a few Chinese pilots and maybe even some Russians, okay? And in our head-to-head -head competitions, we were generally successful, but not as successful as we'd like. So, let's make a Top Gun school. And they did, okay? It's a real thing, it's not fake, okay? So they made a Top Gun school, took our, our Navy pilots there, and, and you probably had to be uh, kind of the top of your class as far as to go there, because they, I think they don't have, only have so many slots at a time. And they teach these pilots how to be an absolutely fantastic fighter pilot. Okay. And it apparently works, okay? Definitely worked for Tom Cruise, okay? I don't know how many, much money he's made from the second one, okay? And got to hang out with Kelly McGillis, too, so. All right. Now, a lot of you guys will recognize his face because he was a Bethesda church member up until the time he passed away about two and a half years ago, okay? Dick Bennett, okay? And he was not a top gun, Okay, but Top Gun expression, he probably would have understood what the heck they were talking about. This is him in 1945. He's a uh, E-7. I would have called it a sergeant first class, but apparently they called it back then tech sergeant grade two. All right. um, he uh, has an office during the war. Okay. 
It's actually on a B-24 bomber. And, and by the way, when he gets done with uh, World War II, if I remember correctly, he becomes an insurance agent, and I'm sure he had an office maybe in Damascus, if not there, probably at his house, okay? So he had an office there. Well, here's his office during the war, okay? And he, he actually has two jobs. One is he's the radio operator, so he's got a little, little desk and a, and a chair he can sit at, you know, and he would take in the radio messages from other places and stuff like that. But his other job, when they're attacked by the enemy and there's no radio messages he needs to deal with, is this. He grabs a 50 caliber machine gun, and he's a waste gunner. Okay? Now, think of me as a plane, let's see, Right wing, left wing, okay? Well, your waist gunners would be right about here, okay? And they have 11 machine guns on here, on this plane. And, you know, they cover a below and above. Let's go through above and below, okay? And the front and the sides and the rear, okay? All those different places. So from the inside view, he's behind this 50 caliber machine gun. Outside view, that's what the 50 cal would look like, okay? Back then, there was no Air Force, okay? It's the United States Army Air Force. I think it changes over in 1949, okay? They take, hey, we need a branch of service that concentrates especially on the Air Force. Let's take the U.S. Army Air Force out and make it the United States Air Force, okay? Which will keep at least one of those beetles employed, you know? Okay? All right. They had a system based on a clock, okay? If you've never heard of this, okay, uh, the plane front, the nose is at 12 o'clock, the plane rear is at 6 o'clock. Dick's area would be uh, about 2 to 5, okay? Again, right wing would be 3 o'clock, left wing 9 o'clock, okay? And they look out and they scan, you know, what's happening around them, okay? So that's Dick's area. And... Uh, preferred area of approach, at least until we put a rear tail gunner out there, was the rear, because it wasn't as covered as well as other places. Okay? Preferred avenue of approach for, for the enemy. Okay? Now, this is a picture of one of the planes from one of Dick's missions. It's not his plane. Okay? But he ends up going to a place called Regensburg, Germany, which is... Not exactly like going to Disneyland, okay? Although going to Disneyland is not quite like going to Disneyland anymore, or Disney World, okay? Uh, different political climate, should we say. Um, not a place you want to go, okay? It's probably not the most defended area. That was probably a place called uh, Palesti Oil Fields in Romania, where Hitler refined his oil for the war effort. But... Lots of anti-aircraft guns, you know, shooting up at you, okay? Lots of enemy fighters protecting the place, okay? And again, you can see the line of the planes there, the times, okay, uh, on the clock. You got 11 machine guns. And inside the plane, they've got intercom, and they talk back and forth with each other, okay? If you're interested in this, there's actually a classic movie from 1949 with Gregory Peck, which is quite good, called 12 O'Clock High. Okay, extremely well done uh, and very stressful. Now, Dick probably wouldn't have paid a whole lot of attention to 12 o'clock high because it would have been a, out of his area of responsibility. Because 12 o'clock, they would have been coming from the front of the plane and they would have been up there. Okay, he might have paid some attention to it. Okay, but maybe more apt, he hears somebody on the intercom up on the front left side saying, hey, bandit at 10 o'clock low. Okay, so he's in front of us at the 10 o'clock position, okay, and you can see where 9 o'clock is there on the, on the plane, okay? And he's down low, which means he's probably going to come up and shoot at us and come out, you know, about our level or maybe even still below us. So if I'm not shooting at anybody right now, get my machine gun ready so that I'm, I know he's coming, okay? So I can shoot my machine gun at him, okay? Band the 10 o'clock low, okay? We'll leave you there, guys. Take about five minutes. We'll get rolling back in about seven or eight, and we'll find out what happens to Dick, you know, maybe. Okay?
day until midnight. Chop, chop. I vote with him. <laughs> All right, Bible, Top Gun. What's the connection? Okay. Guys, the expression, I've got your six, which if you understand the planes, you know, I'm covering the rear of your plane. Got to go back 2,700 years. 700 to 690 B.C., someone there, and look at Isaiah. A little bit more modern origin, when World War I is being fought, it's really the first major use of planes for warfare, okay? And generally, those planes did not have any, like, machine guns in the rear. So if the enemy came on down from you from the rear, they could just sit there and shoot at you, and you would really have to take evasive action and stuff, okay? By World War II, um, your fighter, fighters really aren't covered, but your bombers, again, they got those rear things there. But you go back to Isaiah 58.8, then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear, and your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Okay? So, Top Gun actually goes back to God telling Isaiah what to tell his people in uh, 700 B.C. Okay? And there's your proof right there. Okay? The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Okay? Now... It's a conditional promise, okay? Which means, uh, guys, the Bible has unconditional promises, okay? Which means, you know, they're, they're pretty good for everybody in every situation. I hope I got that biblically correct. Uh, a conditional promise. You need to do something here so that such and such happens, okay? Well, this is a conditional, okay? It has to do with fasting, Go back to verses 1 through 7 in Isaiah 58. And again, this is uh, God talking through Isaiah. And I, I, I'm going to pretend to be God here, although uh, I would say I don't fit the bill very well. But I, I'm going to take his part in some of these uh, things here. So, again, he's got Isaiah talking. Shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Isaiah, raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people the rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day, they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commandments of God. Okay? They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it, Lord? Why have we humbled ourselves and you do not have noticed, or you have not noticed? Yet... On the day of fasting, this is the Lord speaking here, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. All right. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Okay. Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is this what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice, untie the cords of the yoke, set the oppressed free, and break every yoke. It is, is it not to share your food with the hungry, to provide the poor wanderer with shelter, when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Sounds like Jesus, Matthew, what is it, 5, uh, Sermon on the Mount? Okay. I think you could hear that in there. Okay. Then, now here's, here. so guys, it's about fasting. What are you doing on fasting days? And then we go back to our, our eighth verse. Then your Lord, or then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear, and your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. God's got our six, okay? Way before Top Gun, okay? Again, a conditional promise. Is your fasting true in God's eyes? Passage parallels Jesus' teaching. Uh, you might see also uh, Isaiah 56.1. 
This is what the Lord says, maintain justice and do what is right. Okay. Well, is America fasting at the time of the American Revolution? Are we following God's design for fasts? Well, guys, there's a flood of documents out there. Okay. The paperwork is there. Journals of the American Cont or Continental Congress, okay? Uh, 1775, so we actually haven't declared our independence yet. But um, you can go on the Library of Congress website here and find this, bring it up. Actual historical document, very hard to argue with that, okay? Unless you're uh, some of the modern day ignorant historians, okay? Look at this wordage they got in this thing here the Congress is doing. As the great governor of the world, okay, another synonym for God, conducts the course of nature with unerring wisdom, but frequently influences the minds of men to serve the wise and gracious province purposes of his providential government. Now, the green there, okay, is something I add, okay? If you know Proverbs 21.1, okay, which I've talked about probably about four or five times through this series, okay, that's the passage that God changes the course of a king's mind like he changes the course of a stream, Okay? That's what they're saying here. That's what Congress is saying. God influences the minds of men to serve his providential government. Okay? That's our Congress. Congress earnestly recommends July 20th, the day of public humiliation, fasting, and prayer. Because it's right in the document. Okay? Separation of church and state? Nah. Okay? If you don't like that one, let's go, to, let's go another year, March 16, 1776. Uh, notice up at the top, we got in Congress, okay, so it's coming from Congress, our lawmaking body. We don't have our Constitution yet, but uh, we're about ready to declare our independence. A day of humiliation, fasting, and prayer, okay, it's actually in capitalized letters, even though, even if it's capitalized, I don't think you could read, particularly way back there in the back, okay. Check this out. Through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ. Okay? Our Congress. Jesus Christ. Well, kind of hard to tell, but actually somebody came here with an eraser and they wrote in Muhammad, Buddha, you know, uh, whatever. Okay? Doesn't say that. Through the merits of Jesus Christ and mediation of Jesus Christ. Right. Sounds pretty Christian to me. And by the way, down at the bottom, God save the people. Signed by John Hancock, president of uh, uh, Congress at that time. Okay. Now, Congress makes this order. The order goes out to George Washington, okay? and George Washington supports it. And he did this fairly frequently okay? with Thanksgiving proclamations. Okay? Uh, Continental Congress, having ordered it, Let's make Friday, the 17th, the day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer. I command all officers and soldiers to pay strict obedience to the orders of the Continental Congress and have a pious observance of your religious duties to incline the Lord and giver of victory to prosper our arms. Guys, they know where it's important to go to. God is the source of our victory. And Washington recognizes that. So he takes the orders of Congress. And by the way, Washington was very good in understanding the military is here and Congress or whatever the government is over top of them. So the military serves the Congress, which is very unusual for that historical period of time. That's not the way most countries believed. Okay? All right, let's go up th three years. And apparently they like to do these fast proclamations in the spring and then Thanksgiving in the fall after we bring the crop in, you know, which is... Well, probably somewhat biblical. They've got uh, feasting fasts or feasting things going on in the, in the fall. March 20th, recommended day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer. He will continue that wonderful protection with which led us through the paths of danger and distress. Okay. Done in Congress the 20th day of March in the year of not the Lord, your Lord, our Lord, Okay, 1,779, and in the third year of our independence. I've talked about this once before. Guys, they are going back to the Declaration of Independence, and they're, they're making laws and proclamations based on the date of the Declaration of Independence, which has four mentions of God in it, okay? 
There's people in modern day America say, hey, you don't have to pay any attention to the Declaration of Independence. That's just something we did. Okay? It's not connected to our real thing. But they're connecting the two. What we make now with the Declaration. It's like the Declaration is our, it's, it's our mission statement. This is what our mission statement for the country. Okay? And it's based on God, too, by the way. Okay? Again, if you go back and read the Declaration, those four passages. Okay? So it's important that they're connecting it to the Declaration. Okay? Now, I, I decided to jump forward. I was looking at some of these things. And I went forward to 1861. Are we still having days of fasting, humiliation, and prayer? Well, I'm sitting there typing. And guys, I'm an absolutely awful typist. Okay? I think I do about 20 words a minute with about uh, 20 errors uh, in that time. Okay? So, and I go back and look at it, and I said, history? That's supposed to be history. Okay? But I'm sitting there. It's right after the first major battle of Bull or the Civil War, Bull Run. Maybe that was intentional, okay? It actually was pretty gory. Okay? Now, the one thing we haven't done in our fasting, humiliation, and prayer in the American Revolution, we haven't yet, yet addressed the issue of slavery. It's guys going to be our national sin, okay? Not quite like the 1619 Project says, but... We haven't dealt with it, okay? I think God's given us his grace and his mercy here. You know, get us a revolution done, but we need to address slavery. But it's going to be pretty gory. Anybody know how many Americans die in the Civil War? About. 600,000. Yep, over 600,000. Guys. Pretty heavy price. For our national sin, okay? Which, by the way, guys, we correct. We haven't totally, you know, figured out everything yet, okay? But they're working towards it. So, again, it's pretty gory time. Proclamation 85, joint committee of both houses of Congress. We're waiting on the president. We want him to request a day of humiliation, prayer, and fasting to be observed by the president of the United States, or by people of the United States. And then down at the bottom, I, Abraham Lincoln, appoint the last Thursday in September as a day of humiliation, prayer, and fasting, okay? So, 80 years later, we still got fasting days, okay? There's a great organization out there called Wall Builders. It's centered around the true history, our true his Christian history, and they look at documents, okay? So, you can't fake it, okay? You can't write things that aren't true, okay, because they go to the sources, and uh, they say on their website there, during times of crisis, civil authorities would proclaim days of fasting and prayer to seek God's help. They're Christian, according to wall builders. Not bland, not vague, not deistic. Now, here's their list on the next page. Okay. 17 proclamations. Okay. Bob, can you see what color this is way back there? I don't know. Okay, well, good, good. You can see green, okay? We've got black and we've got red, okay? A oh, red is actually the, the name and date of the proclamation, okay? The green means a, it's a presidential proclamation of the United States, okay? So we actually got two down here on the bottom left, and we got three here, uh, two up from the bottom by U.S. presidents, okay? So a total of five of these are coming from U.S. presidents for days of fasting, proclamation, or fasting, humiliation, and prayer, okay? The rest of them are all state governors, okay? So you get the states and the president issuing days of proclamation or, or, or having these proclamations of fasting, humiliation, and prayer, okay? It's both, okay? And again, the president of the United States, Okay? Um, might even go on the White House website and, hey, Joe, you might do like the old days, okay, and uh, issue a day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer here in the United States. See how that works for him, okay? Guys, look at the number of them. The result is we get American independence. We don't quite fix our American, uh, you know, our sin of allowing slavery, but it's in the works, okay? And we'll talk more about that being in the works in the future. Is America born a Christian nation? I don't know how you can deny it if you look at what's actually there. All right, 
guys, we get another desertion. It's the 20th of October, 1781 or 1780. All right. It's around 11 p.m. and there's a soldier. He actually goes into his camp, or probably his tent, and he packs up his guns and his, you know, whatever personal effects he's got, wraps them up, puts them on his horse, leaves, okay? Well, he gets about two miles out, and uh, the commander is actually doing a good job because he's got horse patrols out at nighttime, make sure the British don't sneak up on him. So they see this guy, halt, dark, can't see who he is, kicks the spurs in the horse, goes off, and races away. Um, pretty good horseman, good horse. They don't catch him. They actually go back to camp and report to a pretty competent commander or captain called Patrick Carnes. He would be the, uh, uh, I think, do they have, still have ODs? Officers of the day? Do they still do that? On certain posts. Like, like at nighttime, you know? Yeah. Okay. Well, guys, he would be, you know, everybody, most everybody else is asleep, but he would be staying awake and making sure, you know, things are taken care of. Um, so he, he's probably the officer of the day. And he goes to his boss, Commander Light Horse Harry Lee, and he's informed of a desertion. Okay. Now, this is an inexact quote. Okay. We have enough documentation to know this topic was discussed, but we do not have exactly word-for-word -word quotes on it. So he said something to uh, Light Horse Harry Lee. What are your orders for pursuit, sir? Well... Lee is this man of action, guys. He and six of his men were trapped in a stone tavern, okay, and they were attacked by about 30 British that wanted to take their horses and capture them. Well, they, I think they kill like three of the British and, and wound about three or four more, and they end up running, the British do, and they save themselves, okay? He also makes a special attack on Paulus Hook, I believe it is, and uh, takes that. So this is a man of action. Let's do stuff. Why are you disturbing my sleep? Okay. He's probably going uh, down to the tavern and getting a drink, or he's going to go check on his wife or something like that. Okay. Don't worry about it, you know. Well, finally says, go check the picket line for a horse. See if there's a horse missing. Well, Carnes being pretty competent, he goes out and checks the horse line, and there is a horse missing, and he again, seems to be even more competent from what I can tell here. He calls out his men, and they kind of take the roll, right? Who's here, 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 here? Oh, this guy's not here. Turns out to be Sergeant Major John Champ, right? Well, Sergeant Major is pretty high rank, okay? I expect to see a young Josh Beal there in about 10 years, okay? Because he's, he's an E7 right now. I think Sergeant Major is E9, so, but you gotta, gotta be there a while. So I think he's got a few more years to put under his belt, but seems to be a pretty competent young man, and uh, it was always a pleasure to work with him when, I, when, I, when he was around. Okay. Um, so because it's Champ, Lee calls out a coronet. It's not, not a term we use anymore. Back in this particular time, it would be a low ranking officer like a naval ensign or in America, in the Army or the Marine Corps, uh, be what we call a butter bars, a second lieutenant, about as low as you can go, okay? okay? Andy's way above that, you know? So, how much do those butter bars know? <laughs> okay, I think the laugh says it all, okay? Um, anyway, take this cornet out, take 15 men, go track him down, okay? Well, guys, it's nighttime. But luckily for the patrol, it's been raining, okay? So the road, you can check out tracks pretty, a little bit better. Um, and apparently they're able to do that. And, and actually the, the blacksmith was instructed to do something pretty good. So all the horses he makes, or the whole, all the horseshoes he makes for this unit, he puts a special mark on it so that when they you know, are going down the road, there's a special mark compared to other horses. So if you've got a group going out and then another group follows them later and you can't see them, they can look down and say, oh yeah, this is where our men went and they continue on that way. Well, for Champ, not so good because they know that he went this way. So, and Dragoons is a term for uh, our cavalrymen. Morning breaks, 
and they can speed up their travel, they can see the tracks easier, and they start to pick up speed, and they get to a top of a hill north of what's now Bergen, New Jersey, and they look down, and they see Champ down there, I guess somewhat down the valley, pretty much at the same time Champ looks up and says, uh-oh, okay, he's close on my tail. So the pursuit begins in earnest. Okay. I don't know if that's exact uniforms for that particular period of time, but we get the idea here. Um, so, Cornet, they get up to a road junction as they follow him or chase him, and he says, hey, you three guys go down this road. See, he's probably going to Paul's hook. See if you can get there and take the shortcut and get ahead of him, and the rest of us will follow him and chase him. Okay. Well, Champ's pretty smart. He gets down in a valley or behind some woods where they, he knows the, the Americans can't see him. Hey, they think I'm going to Paulus Hook. Let me go off here to uh, Bergen, okay? And he tries to stay, and I don't exactly know how he did this, whether they had cobblestones actually in the town or if there was a bunch of, you know, horse tracks right there, and he tried to run through there uh, so to disguise his own tracks. But he's able to confuse the Americans it takes him about another five minutes to pick up his trail, which gives him a little bit more of a lead, okay? They do find it. They pick up the trail, and they start to close in on him just as, as, as he's at the river. Well, he sees the British ships out there on the river. He abandons his horse, and uh, there's a pretty sharp British officer on one of these uh, British galleys. He says, hey, those are American. He's an American. There's Americans chasing him. They don't look very friendly. He's probably a deserter. Load the gun with grape shot, okay? Bunch of little balls there. If you get, they shoot it out, it shoots out about 60 balls, and you don't want to be in front of one of them, okay? Um, take a boat. See if you can go out there and get him. Pick this deserter up, because he assumes he's a deserter, because they're both in American uniforms. Champ takes off his belt, his scabbard, which probably has a sword on it. You know, cavalrymen used swords quite a bit back there. Your, uh, your guns are one shot. Kind of hard to reload on the top of a horse. Straps his knapsack to his back, and he enters the river. Help, help, save me. You know? And uh, the British apparently starts shooting at the cavalry. And we got an illustration here. This is probably from Benjamin Laurent Lossing's uh, account of the historical account for the American Revolution. And you can see him out here going out there and the British, you know, firing at the Americans, the pursuit. Well, here's our Sir Henry Clinton again. Historian George F. Shear writes, by a margin of 50 or 60 yards and with the sucker of the enemy, the British, Champ was saved from the pistols of his own corps. He's taken on board. The captain writes up, he does an inter interrogation of Champ and writes up the details and what he saw and sends him off to New York, probably with a guard, to this place here, number one Broadway, okay, to the Kennedy Mansion, which was actually used by Washington, okay, uh, and that was not Jeff Kennedy, okay, <laughs> one of his relatives, you know, okay. He ever invite you up there, Jeff? Yeah. No? Okay. Um, anyway, when Washington is there in 1776, he made it his headquarters, and then Washington left the area, kind of forced out there by the British, and the British have taken it over, and that's the British headquarters there, okay? And in there is our uh, Clinton, apparently quite spectacular place, high ceilings, you know, uh, beautiful rooms, uh, nice place to... Uh, a B, I guess it was uh, built by a British naval officer in, I think, 1764. And you can get another view of it here from the northeast. Okay? So that last one would have been a view from the southeast. Okay? Um, gentlemen, tricorn hats, stroll before the Kennedy House, before the war. But we get a good picture there. Again, again kind of row houses, number one Broadway at Clinton headquarters. Okay. This is Benedict Arnold. He's changed his blue uniform for a red uniform, being a traitor. He's taken to the Kennedy Mansion, and again, Clinton in interrogates him. Out of the people like Washington, you know, are you getting enough food? 
uh, you're getting enough ammunition, what's your morale, that kind of stuff. So he talks to Clinton for a while. He gives him two guineas. You should go visit Benedict Arnold. It doesn't take him long to start providing traitors information. One of uh, Clinton's aides, General, uh, Adjutant General George Beckwith. And by the way, guys, an Adjutant General is not necessarily a general. As a matter of fact, usually is not, to the best of my knowledge. Okay. Uh, he writes, Sar uh, John Champ, Sergeant Major in Major Lee's Corps, deserted from Passaic Fall last Thursday. Actually, it was Friday. Major Lee's uh, Corps consists of 90 men and 100 dismounted. Marquis de, de Lafayette's infantry are there. Provisions vary irregularly. Given out some days, they get nothing. The ration, a pound, fresh beef, and ditto on the flour. Soldiery very much dissatisfied with the French. So Champ is already providing information to the British here, according to the adjutant. All right. God's hand, okay? Take a little side trip here. Guys, this is that map that you see up there. My dad had this. He was actually from uh, Brooklyn, which is uh, not on this map, but uh, I guess it's off across the East River. And it was in his house, and I was, uh, or apartment, I was cleaning it out about two years ago. I said, well, I'm not a big fan of New York. Okay? I don't, probably will have no need for this. And then I got this little voice, well, you know, it's of historical importance. Okay? So you might use it someday. So I kept it. Well, guys, this is that map. Okay. And this is not an original. It's a copy of one made in 1660 when it was New Amsterdam. Okay. Uh, history on New York, New Amsterdam was originally settled by the Dutch. They call it New Amsterdam. It's later changed to uh, New York. Okay. But the map actually lays out this particular area of Manhattan very well for what's happening here uh, that I'm about to, ready to tell you, okay? Now, up at the top left, guys, you see the Hudson River, and you can see the arrows. That's the direction of flow, and it's actually flowing from the right side to the left side. Down at the bottom left, you got Fort Amsterdam in the days of the Dutch in 1660. It's now, 120 years later, Fort George, okay? But the fort's basically in the same place. Going a little bit to the right, you got the Bowling Green, and a little bit over there, you got uh, De Hera Strait, okay? I don't know exactly how the Dutch pronunciation is, which eventually becomes Broadway, okay? And you know, anybody want to sing, hey, lights on Broadway, you can sing that for us, Mark? Okay. Um, now, our particular interest is this area right here, okay? And by the way, guys, note that north on the map is to the right side. Most of the time, it's at the top of a map. But it, I think it's easier for us to see this if I laid it sideways, so I did, okay? We've got at number one Broadway, okay, Clinton's headquarters, and it would have been right there. And in 1660, that building is not really there. Looks like they got a, some smaller building back there. And by the way, the buildings don't exactly stay like this 120 years later. Arnold's headquarters, because he's working for the British Army now, is at number three Broadway, okay? And behind there, there's a garden area, okay? And all those things are going to be kind of important for what happens next, okay? So you got, you got kind of a layout with this uh, God helping me to make sure that I had this map so I could show you and enlighten you some, okay? Well, there's a number of people that defect because of Arnold. Hey, this was our, our leading hero, combat fight, fighting general of the war, and he has deserted. If he's deserting and he was that high up, why are we still here? And some of them started to question, and apparently the British are getting more, Amer more American deserters. Clinton and Beckworth both interview him. They both believe his story. Um, and... They take this as a positive sign, because Light Horse Harry Lee's unit was a, a unit with a lot of what they call esprit de corps. They have a lot of pride. They do good missions. They are generally very successful, okay? So to have somebody desert from that unit is a pretty big thing. Maybe the Americans are really going downhill quick. Okay. Well, again, number one versus number three. Broadway, 
Clinton's headquarters at number one, Arles at number three. Uh, again, uh, let's see, Clinton recommended you, that he go see Arnold. And he's out there on the street, and apparently Arnold recognizes his, his uniform, okay? Uh, the light horse cavalry dragoon uniform that recognizes his rank, and they strike up a conversation. Well, Arnold's been trying to get Americans that are loyal to the king, raise them into a unit, and have them join and fight with the British. Okay. So he's happy to see Champ, and uh, Champ tells him something like, hey, it's your example that made me desert. Okay. Plays to uh, Arnold's ego, which is probably pretty big. He also says, hey, Arnold says, now that you're joining my unit, will you be my recruiter? Go out and find some other Americans that can join this unit. So he gets to see Arnold pretty frequently. And he's going to be put in Captain Cameron's camp company. Right. And again, we can see a, uh, a view of uh, Broadway a little bit further up the street, and we can see where Arnold's headquarters is. So again, kind of row houses, four-story building up the street a little bit, and we got the Bowling Green here that was on the map. Okay, so Champ and Arnold would have met probably somewhere on the street. Well, guys, what you see is not what you get, okay, despite that 1960 song, okay? Let's travel back a couple weeks in time. 16 October, Light Horse Harry Lee, Major Harry, Henry Lee, writes Washington, kind of a cryptic message here. I communicate this to your excellency, at least a, a mention of it by those gentlemen to you may alarm you on the score of secrecy. Be assured, sir, I shall endeavor most earnestly to accomplish your wishes and have hopes to establish commencement on Wednesday next. What the heck does that mean, okay? Purposely written kind of ambiguous. Well, there's another letter sent to Washington about the same time, but there's no date on it. I have engaged two persons to undertake the accomplishment of Your Excellency's wishes. And again, this is Light Horse Harry Lee to Washington. The chief is a sergeant in my cavalry. To him, I have prayed, promised promotion. The other is an inhabitant of Newark. I have had experience of his fidelity. To this man, I have engaged 100 guineas. I'm going to pay him 100 guineas, 500 acres of land, and three Negroes. So he's actually giving slaves to, to this guy in New Jersey to help out this, this mission. Okay. Outlines of the scheme which I have re recommended are that the sergeant should join General Arnold as a deserter from us, should engage in his court now raising, and should contrive to insinuate himself into some sort of menial or military berth about the general's person. When the favorable moment arrives, they should seize the prize in the night, gag him, and bring him. Okay. If your excellency approves of what is done, the sergeant will desert from us tomorrow. A few guineas will be necessary for him. George Washington back response, dear sir, the plan proposed for taking A has every mark of a good one. I therefore agree to your promised rewards and give it my fullest approbation with the express stipulation and project pointed injunction that he, Arnold, or is brought to me alive. Okay? And actually, that's the way it was printed and the source. No circumstances whatever shall obtain my consent to his being put to death. My aim is to make a public example of him, and this should be strongly impressed upon your men, okay? Guys, what's happening with Champ? Undercover. Undercover. Guys, he's an undercover operative here. Guys, can you imagine doing this? You have to desert from your own men. They might be shooting at you. They're chasing you. You have to go see the British. They might shoot at you because you're in an enemy uniform. You have to... Uh, develop some credibility, then you go sit in Clinton's headquarters and talk to him and his adjutant, and then you recruit for the British, all the way trying to figure out how can we get a hold of this guy and kidnap him, okay? Um, John Champ have any guts? I'd say a whole lot more than me. I don't think I could be doing that, okay? What's the plan? Uh, Light Horse Harry Lee's description of Champ, rather above the common size, full of bone and muscle, grave, ta thoughtful, taciturn of tried courage and inflexible perseverance. He's actually a stalker here, okay? Dangerous undercover role, he methodically shadows him and discovers 
What is he doing at certain times of day? Is there any time where we know he's pretty much always at the same place that we can maybe work, make this work? And he finds out, end of the day, Arnold goes out in the garden behind number three and kind of strolls around and, you know, maybe gets his mind clear or uh, maybe he's saying his prayers. Probably not, but um, whatever. And then he takes a trip to the outhouse before he goes in for the night. Every night, okay? And seems to be pretty much clockwork. Champ, there's a fence back there, and he, over those seven weeks, kind of loosens them up. He doesn't take the planks out, because then somebody would probably repair them. But he's got them loosened so that on the night, whoosh, they can pull them out and uh, have them easily removed. And he's able to establish his contacts with Mr. Baldwin, the guy from New Jersey, who's going to help him with this. And uh, again, kind of like in the letter, we'll jump him, bind him, gag him, sneak him through an alley to the river. And we'll make sure we got a boat there to pick him up and take him back to American lines. And again, th this is coming from Washington. Okay? Uh, he's got it in for, for Arnold. Uh, and I'd say rightly so. Washington had stood up for Arnold a number of times uh, when he was kind of unfairly criticized in some cases. Well, what impact does it make on the British that Champ was being chased? Okay. It helps the story out and establishes his, his cover. Okay. He really seems like a deserter. He was being chased, maybe even shot at. We, historical accounts don't say he got shot at, but uh, maybe. They're going to have to travel past uh, in an alley past number one Broadway. There's a guard there. So we'll have Baldwin on one side and me on the other. We'll have him in the center. And if he calls out and challenges, he say, oh, this is uh, Sergeant Champ. You know, we've got a guy here. He's drunk. We're taking him home to his wife or something to that effect. OK, we just need to get him home. Oh, OK, go ahead. And that's somewhat speculation, but that's what their plan was, you know. Uh, in case they get stopped. There's a boat it's supposed to be waiting at the pier behind the British headquarters out there by the river on the other side of the garden. All right, now, this is South Manhattan in uh, actually three years hence, because we're sitting in 1780 right now, in October, I think it is. All right. um, this original 1776 fence, my understanding is still up there in New York. Okay. It actually had crowns on it around there, and at a certain point they saw them all off, okay, because I guess they didn't want crowns on there anymore. Uh, so anyway, the, the Bowling Green is still there, the fort was there at that particular time. This is probably number one Broadway, the headquarters, although it's a little hard to tell. And again, we've got the uh, Hudson River here in the background and New Jersey on the far shore, okay. And uh, we also have the King Statue pedestal. If you've ever seen the, uh, the charging bull up there from New York, you know, they got a, some kind of a statue of a bull. I guess it maybe relates to Wall Street or something. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's apparently like on the north side of the Bowling Green, although I've never been there. Okay. But, um, and speaking of bowling, apparently it goes back to ancient Egypt is what they think. Okay. And uh, the Dutch brought the game, and maybe were playing it in New Amsterdam as early as 1626. Okay. Oldest park in New York, established in 1733. It's still there, although it's pretty doggone small in that area of Manhattan. And I gather bowling back in these days, you don't have 10 pins, duck pins, okay? You have a marker ball, kind of like bocce ball if you've ever played bocce, okay? And you throw out the marker, and then you try to roll your balls as close to it as possible. Now, this actually sounds kind of fun and kind of challenging, because apparently the balls are biased, OK? Uh, yeah. I guess if they lean to the left, they're Democrat. If they lean to the right, they're Republican, OK? <laughs> actually, that's not what it means. Apparently, they're weighted, OK? So that if you roll the ball, anybody ever done this with, with a weighted ball? OK? If you roll it and you got the weights on the right side, it's probably going to roll to the right or, or roll to the left if you got it the other way. I don't know how you make it go straight. Um, sounds like a challenge, okay? But 
Um, they still have competitions in here in New York uh, for quite some time. Uh, I don't think they actually do there on the Bowling Green anymore, although I think they do have a bowling club up there in New York City somewhere. Okay. Another historic event, guys, go back four years. July 4, 1776, Declaration of Independence signed. It's sent to George Washington, and he gets it probably on the 8th of July, because uh, we're talking of going from Philadelphia to New York City, and uh, couldn't exactly get on the train or the plane or anything like that. So he orders a reading of this five-day-year-old Declaration of Independence, and apparently it's published in the newspapers at that particular time. So there's a lot of Americans, hey, we're, not, we're free from a king and all this stuff like that. And they decide, let's go down to the Bowling Green to the pier where there's a statue, and the king, George, has a statue there, okay? Let's take it down. We can make it into bullets, okay? Okay? So they topple it down, behead it. By the way, the head disappears. Somebody takes it as a souvenir, and apparently the horsetail disappears on a statue too. Um, the horsetail was discovered uh, about 100 years later, I, I think in a swamp behind a farm. It was either in Rhode Island or Connecticut, and they dig it out, and the New Yorkers find out about this in their historical society. Hey, let's put together some money and see if we can buy it. So they bought it for 100 bucks, and apparently you can go to their historical society museum and, and still see it, okay? But uh, a lot of it molded down to bullets, and we shoot them at British soldiers and probably kill and wound a few of them, okay? We got William Walcott's painting of the issue, although, again, it's nighttime, not dead of night, but more like twilight, from what I can tell historically. And you can see him pulling it down. I think the statue actually faces west, although I can't confirm that. The reason why I say that is you got another painting here by Ortel, and you've got, looks like a sunset, and the sun sets in the west. So uh, the statue here is kind of facing towards the river in the west. That would make sense, I think, in that area of Manhattan. Uh, a couple of historical inaccuracies. There was no report of a, a Native American family there. This is I, supposedly Alexander Hamilton, one of these three people here. He wasn't there. Um, and this is probably number one Broadway at General Clinton's headquarters. But and there's somewhat question on that, but it gives you a little perspective about what, where things are. All right, let's go back to our map here. And uh, our green arrow is our escape route. So we're going to kidnap him here in the garden area, get through that fence. Again, general headquarters there. I don't know if that building's still standing there 120 years later or not, but uh, head off to the river, okay, and uh, take Arnold there. Get him down the river and take him off to New Jersey. So a probable escape route. That would be a guess. This is a 2020 map of New York's Manhattan. 9-11 Memorial is right here. And our uh, number one three Broadway is like right in here, okay? By the way, guys, they've added a lot of dirt and filled in, okay? Built out New York. So it's actually wider than it was by substantially, okay? So... I don't think any of this stuff was here, this land. Okay, and they've done that in a number of places in New York. Best laid plans. Now, his late horse, Harry Lee, he knew about this desertion. So he was stalling on purpose, trying to buy Champ some time, but at the same hand, not trying to let the uh, cat out of the bag. Okay. It's 11th December. This is the night the champ is picked. Seven weeks, he's got everything's uh, pretty well laid out. The British decide, we're going to go down to Virginia. And Arnold's legion is going to go with us. So Arnold's headquarters moves. Arnold's troops, hey, go down to whatever dock at whatever place and load up. And champ's supposed to go with them. Arnold's not going to be there that night. Um, probably doesn't have the opportunity to inform Baldwin and probably doesn't have the opportunity to then for the Americans to know and cancel their ship there. They get down to James River in Virginia, I think about three weeks later. 
apparently a rough trip. They get some of the horses died on the trip. And John's kind of trapped. Where do you go? You know, you're surrounded by British soldiers. And uh, if he's captured, it's a death sentence if he tries to desert. But he doesn't really want to fight against his own country either. So he links, uh, uh, the unit links up with British General Cornwallis, probably in South Carolina. Then they go into North Carolina. And Champ finally gets a, a chance to escape and uh, travels through the Patriot areas. He gets back to his old unit, and Major Lee, I don't know if he hugged him, but he, I'm sure he shook his hand and welcomes him warmly. And his soldiers are saying, this guy was a deserter. What are you welcoming him back like this for? The secret was that well kept. <laughs> Prodigal son returns, okay? Um, uh, Lee makes sure his men know, hey, guys, he was on a secret mission. He was trying to ca kidnap Arnold. So, you know, hey, three cheers for... Uh, the intrepid and gallant sergeant. So all is forgiven. <clears throat> Champ, lots of dangers to face. If you can imagine all that. Uh, Light Horse Harry Lee writes in his memoirs, Washington presented him with a discharge from further service, lest he might in the vicissitudes of war fall into enemy's hands, when if recognized, he was sure to die on a gibbet. In other words, be hung. Okay? If he fought, if he put his blue uniform back on and he was ever captured and somebody in the British Army recognized him, they would probably kill him on the spot. Maybe not even hang him, just shoot him, you know. So he's retired. Okay? Interestingly enough, a couple years after the war, there's a British officer traveling through Loudoun County, Virginia. Okay? And, and, and this is before they had all these bathroom incidents. It's, okay? uh, thunderstorm, okay? Not a place to be ri riding out safe with horses, okay? Let's stop, and they stop at Champ's house, okay? This officer and his uh, uh, party of, I, I don't know, I, I just thought it was a party, so probably three, or maybe four, okay? They welcome him in, you know, probably offer some food and stuff like that. And Champ and the officer, I think I know this guy from somewhere. And they start talking about their experiences, and Arnold apparently tells him, yeah, I was on a mission to capture the British. And then they discover this officer that's there was actually the company commander, Captain uh, uh, Cameron, okay, that uh, Champ was assigned to. Okay, so when he's put in that unit with Arnold, he's in his unit. And they t guys meet together. And... Uh, Apparently quite, you know, friendly. And uh, one of the reasons we know the story is Captain uh, Cameron writes it down in his journal and eventually sells the story to a British magazine called Blackwoods. And I think you can actually still find the, the copies online, okay? Um, so that helps promote his story. It's not like it was totally forgotten because it's in Light Horse Harry Lee's memoirs as well. He gets his own comic book, you know, and he gets a uh, Virginia, you know, road sign. You know, here's the home of Sergeant Major John Champ, hero of the revolution. So he also gets his own ballad. Okay. 28 stanzas, okay? Actually pretty catchy, too. Uh, come sheath your swords, my gallant boys, and listen to the story how Sergeant Champ one gloomy night set off to catch the Tory. Our, our general here in the next one is, uh, is Washington. You see, the general had gotten mad to think his plans were thwarted and swore by all, both good and bad, that Arnold should be carted. So unto Lee he sent a line and told him all his sorrow and said that he must start the hunt before the coming morrow. Lee found a sergeant in his camp made up of bone and muscle who never knew fear in many a year with Tories had a tussle. Okay, so, and again, there's another 24 stanzas out there somewhere. Okay. Guys, lots of stuff going on. Uh, go back to 700 B.C. for uh, God having our backs. Okay, and then all this stuff going on here with the thing. Um, and uh, our gerrymandering in Maryland, 2011. 1812, first use of gerrymandering. In our January 23, 2023, Born Alive bill passes in the House. Okay. Treason of Arnold has spillover effects, but kind of unifies a lot of Americans, you know. We not, not only do we dislike the British, but we dislike Arnold, who's fighting for him. Our Born Alive bill gathers only one-party support. 
Unfair gerrymandering is an issue in Maryland, and uh, Congress in Maryland and military call for days of fasting and prayer. God has our sex, going to be our rear guard. And George Washington's plan to capture Arnold Fails, 1619 Project. Are we declaring independence to protect slavery? I don't think Champ would agree with that, okay? And we'll deal more with 1619 Project sometime in the future. Okay. If uh, everything goes well together, this gentleman will be here four weeks from tonight. He's a 99-year-old World War II veteran in a tank destroyer unit. He's got a very interesting story to tell. He seems to be a very spiritual man, a member of the United Methodist Church. Okay, out there in uh, Williamsport, where they don't seem to have problems with... Uh, deciding about marriage and who can get married. He says, our pastor's never even discussed anything like that. They're not doing that. So, um, very spiritual man. I, I think you'll enjoy him. And uh, if everything comes together, uh, we're working on his story right now. Actually, for, a, for his birthday in June. He's going to be 100 in June. Okay. So, uh, but once I got talking to him, I said, you know, he, he might enjoy coming here, and you guys might enjoy listening to him. I think you will. Okay. He believes in the spirit, okay, and talks about it frequently. So, any questions, comments, okay? And Pam, you can, you can stay and we can talk for the next hour <laughs> if you want. Just send Mark home, you know. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anything else? Well, enjoy your evening, guys. Sorry we ran so long, but... <laughs>